thank you for staying with us. Um, and thank you for joining us if you've only just joined us. So I'm going to introduce our panel um, and I'm going to do this in a very abbreviated way because these people have all got formidable biographies, but you are all capable of going and finding them and reading them for yourselves online. Uh, and I really recommend that you do because their experience is so rich and so varied. Um, so I first met Haley Foster uh, re at, a, at a recent forum actually on uh, whether coercive control should be legislated as a crime. Um, she is, as many of you would know, the newly appointed CEO of Rape and Domestic Violence Services Australia. She's a passionate advocate and leader for some of the most vulnerable women in our community. Maha Abdo, uh, came here from Lebanon at the age of 12. She spent over three decades working together with the Muslim Women's Association to help give Muslim women safety and assurance in difficult and trying circumstances. She works at the local, national and international levels, advising government on policy, strategies and services. And I'm very aware of a lot of the work that uh, Maha and women like her do is very much under the radar and gets very little acknowledgement. Um, so I'm particularly pleased to have Maha with us today. She's been quite vocal recently about the police presence in Lakemba during this latest COVID lockdown. Noreen Young is of proud Eora, Scottish and Swedish descent. She is one of Australia's leading and most respected workplace diversity practitioners and thinkers. Noreen is industry professor for Indigenous policy at the UTS Jambana Institute for Indigenous Education and Research and leads Jambana's highly innovative Indigenous people and work research and practice hub. It's the only one of its kind internationally. The hub focuses on robust research and analysis, policy, practice, people and law reform around the workplace experience of indigenous people. Um, and you have, of course, hopefully all already met Emma Dawson, but for those of you that are just joining us now, um, I will just remind you that she is the CEO of Per Capita, a progressive independent think tank, and we will be posting her speech, her wonderful speech, on our website shortly in case you missed it. Now, um, I'm going to ask each of you to pick up on something from Emma's speech that resonated with you in particular and resonated with you in relation to the cohort that you represent. But I just thought that I would start, Noreen, with you. Um, I mentioned that I think that there's a broad consensus and readiness to adopt the Uluru statement uh, amongst the community, within the community. But I'm just wondering about what needs to happen next. How can we build stronger bridges across the divide that separates women of color, indigenous and Torres Strait Islander women, women with disability, older women, younger women, so we can bring about change? What needs to happen? What do we need to do differently? Um, thanks, Caroline. Um, in terms of the Uluru Statement, I think that the ball is now in the politician's court. Um, the government, I, clearly there is significant community support for all of the elements for the statement in full to be adopted. Um, there are treaty processes going on in the States, in Victoria and um, Queensland at the moment. Um, I think that's fine. I think, you know, the more we can get treaty processes embedded, the better it is for the us of the Uluru Statement. Um, so I think we need to elect a government that will adopt it in full. It's really straightforward. Um, and that's one of the things that a change of government would do. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm an all-rounder and there's, you know, not just Indigenous policy to, to change, but um, it, the Uluru Statement would be a significant step forward in um, how we deal with First Nations um, existence in this country and the historical injustices that our people have endured. So I think it's really important. In terms of bridging the divide in feminism, I think that 
white feminism, in particular corporate feminism, needs to um, reflect mm -hmm. and think about adopting an intersectional approach. Um, I consider myself of culturally diverse background as well as um, Indigenous. Um, and I, for me, it's always been the case that white feminism has dominated, has been dominated by um, a kind, a, a, by a, a certain cohort um, that hasn't taken the intersections between race and class seriously and disability. Um, and those intersections are very profound. I think the years that we spent with the, sec with the Human Rights Commission fixated on women on boards set us back very significantly. Um, and, and unfortunately that um, still resounds. It um, was the case that that became the dominant discussion um, Whereas for my money, we should be considering pay equity, for example, um, violence against women as the dominant discussion. We've never ever asked the question, well, I have, but I'm one of the few people who has publicly, what do we think is going to change if all those women get on boards? What do we expect of them? What are they going to do on corporate boards? And I think there's a few women who are active in those circles who think about their responsibility to other women, but I think it's problematic. Um, and that's changing. I think we're going back to a much more basic feminist approach, but I also do think that white feminism does need to reflect and consider the views and, and consider the inclusion um, of women from intersectional backgrounds as well. Mm -hmm. Just um, thank you for that. Just following on then from Emma's speech, what particularly resonated for you or what are the points that you would like to pick up from that speech? I'm particularly concerned about homelessness um, and women uh, across <laughs> the board and I, I think um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, home uh, housing is always precarious. Um, I think one of the things that COVID and its impact in remote communities in New South Wales, for instance, has highlighted is the woeful lack of adequate housing um, for remote Indigenous communities. And I think um, a lot of people don't understand that remote communities exist in our state, as do the former mission communities. Um, in the, on the North Coast, for example, and, and in the West, um, people like to have this romantic idea of remote communities being in the Territory. Um, they're not, they are, but they're not. We have lots of remote communities in our own state and the former mission communities where housing is absolutely inadequate and, um, you know, massive problems exist and those... Um, adequate funding of those communities has never occurred um, under a, a succession of governments and they're totally neglected. Um, and I, so I think that precarious housing is precarious for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in the cities as well, improving um, through increased funding to the Aboriginal Housing Office and, and it is getting better, but it, it requires a great deal of attention. Um, but I think that women who have been at the intersections, particularly in terms of earning, because we know that um, earnings are less uh, for over the, the job life cycle for women from intersectional backgrounds, again, um, homelessness and poverty in retirement is a massive issue. I live with that in my own family. Um, my mother is on the pension and um, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Look, I'm so glad that you mentioned the uh, remote communities in New South Wales because I have friends who drove a truck out to Wilcannia with supplies last week and it took them 13 hours. Yeah. 
Uh, and then they described what it was like when they got there in terms of there being no accommodation for them overnight. So they camped while they were there. And it is a really salutary reminder of yeah. just how completely forgotten and abandoned those communities are. They should not be getting relief packages from groups of well-intentioned artists. That's not how you run a country, you know, that's that's not what artists are there to provide. So, you know, thank you very much for mentioning that. Um, Maha, can we come to you now? Um, I wonder whether you could share with us what the most pressing problems are um, that are faced by the women that you are assisting and that you, in a sense, represent. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, peace be with you all. And, and I'd like to sincerely acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm working from um, remotely in the Canberra Bankstown area that is in, in the lockdown. I'd like to acknowledge those that are with us today and those that will come after us and those that have been before us, because I think it is important if we're really sincere about, you know, um, talking about equity and equality and then talking about what is happening in, in, in you know, with the women that I work with and the team that we, we're working together at Muslim Women Australia because Muslim Women Association has now become Muslim Women Australia and we have services in Victoria and other parts of Australia but mainly um, you know the you know, I, I fully agree with what Noreen was saying about the intersectionality approaches and all of that in the in, in policies and everything but at the grassroots level I mean you know we we've we've got to be serious and uh, you know um, to listen to what is actually happening right now without us um, clouding our thoughts about what we think should happen. The voices and the concerns in the community is clearly about our city is divided into, into two, the, them and us. And, and, and that's what we're dealing with, you know, while having to continuously bring hope back into the, into the space with the community saying, you know, there's good, there's light at the end of the tunnel, all of the above. We're seeing young people and young women and older women are being mistreated, whether it's whether it's through the social, um, you know, um, cohesive aspect of, of life where, you know, older women get treated differently, especially if you come from a various cultural background. For Muslim women, there's this stigma that Muslim women, you know, the older women are, you know, they breed those so-called terrorists, those so-called anything that sort of has a negative connotation to it. So you've got to undercut, under you know, um, sort of uncover all these layers before you actually come out to speak about what your real concerns are, like everyone else around here. You know, we're all the same. I'm one of the older now women who see, who've been through the community now for nearly, nearly 40 years. And I was raised in the community and I've seen, and I was raised as, as you know, as, 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 the, as we were getting over the white Australian policy. So, so I could see the good that was coming out. I felt I belonged, I felt I was being supported. But my concern right now is that what we're hearing on the ground is that, and, and, and from women, you know, it's is, is clearly about other women who were causing harm to these women, where you are no longer, and, and that sort of comes in the space of delivery, service delivery, right? because we've got our own biases and we need to sort of call it out. I'm not here to sort of say, you know, everything looks so lovely and rosy. There are amazing good people out there. But if we're really looking at, you know, really calling it out and really calling for change, we've got to be aware of our own biases because we come with that without realizing unless we get to know each other and really understand where we're all coming from, we will always bring, you know, make it harder for women of cultural background or women of color to really just get their foot in the door literally or even peek through a window or a, a, a or a, a you know a keyhole so um it is difficult domestic violence is seen is now we're seeing it differently we're seeing older women um you know with a generational with extended family um and that we're seeing more of coercive controlling in in families um and we're seeing um so we're, we're and especially with, um, you know, uh, as mothers, we have boys, you know, and so where we see that, you know, respecting older women and working with older women is a soft entry to accessing the whole of the community, really. So that's something we need to do. And, um, and you know, I could go on and on about what is, 
what is happening right now, but we could all see it. We could all sort of see what's going on with the division. You know, we're all in this together. I'd love to say we are all in, the, in this together, but we're not on the same boat, you know? You know, some of us are in sitting, just hanging on to a lifeboat with all the, you know, while in the storm, we're, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. But I'd like to really sincerely believe that, you know, from what Emma, what, what was, you know, she spoke about, you spoke about Emma, the success, you know, what does success look like? You know, the health and well-being, and how do you measure success? You know, we need to tap into the, 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 the asset that is in the community with older women, so that we look at what does a health and well-being look like in certain communities in my community and i'm talking about you know the diverse over 100 ethnic communities under the banner of islam right that are living right now in new south wales what, what does security look like time is a is is valuable within the islamic tradition how do we really hone down on the positive aspects that we all live by and create a space that we can actually start to, to harness the good, just like we do that we, with, hopefully we do that with our Indigenous sisters. You know, we look at, you know, there are women business, there are men business. And how do we do that without creating a divide of them and us, or look at them and look at that? So um, how do we care for each other as a community? Hmm? I think these are questions, but we can't answer them on our own. I think we've got to bring the young to, 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 to support in that change, in that sort of, and I call it a, a, a wave of peace in action. I'd like to see that sort of a transformation that happens in an evolving way where you bring your heart and mind to a space of, you know, bring the intergener in the, all the generations into that space, but with a very authentic, way where we can we're all able to be vulnerable mm. without it being labeled as oh yeah because that's your faith and that's your culture that's how you are we really know and and before we can talk about equity hmm, we need to understand how does it look like for each one of us so when we're working down on the, on that at the moment in the in families who are COVID positive yeah, and when we hear the police going out there and calling a roll call, yeah, names that are just objects, that really breaks my heart, you know. And how do we really change that without just naming and shaming people? Because I'm not about naming and shaming police or any other people for that matter. I think we have learned and I realise that it is important to name to change because hmm? without naming and labeling and, and naming the change, we cannot change it. And, and, and we have the recommendation that we're able to move forward, but in an inclusive way that is not just equitable. Hmm? And it's not about, when we talk about equality of women, um, you know, and, and as Noreen alluded to white women, and I think with respect to the many white women, it's not an intentional thing. I never imagine it is an international, intentional thing, but we need to be um, aware of our intention when we're sitting with women by, uh, you know, creating a safe space without being condescending or overpowering because we just come into a space and we, we want to have a great input. We want to make change and we want to create a safe space because we want to learn from each other. I can learn from all of you around here and we can all, hopefully, we le you learn from us. So I think it's an open heart, putting together an action plan that is inclusive of all women. And I, I, I think it's important to bring men into that space because, again, going back to in the domestic violence space 30 years ago because it was a women's piece only and and without providing bringing men to the space we're finding that the change is is there's a bit more momentum in that by them taking responsibility not anything else so i think you know when we're talking about economic um, inequality 
social inequality, all of that, it is an inclusive way of bringing the whole of community to really put hope in action that brings out hopefully a wave that creates that sort of a momentum of, of shifting. And, and so for, for my son and for my daughter can really be able to talk about it with no fear of reprisals in that manner. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow, Maha, thank you so much for that um, wonderful statement and also for drawing attention to something uncomfortable, I think, which is the calling out of those unconscious biases that um, do creep in to a lot of these conversations, even the most well-intentioned conversations. So I really, really appreciate you flagging that. And just, um, and also, by the way, if you need to go and get a glass of water, you can go and get a, get a glass of water. I'm going to come to Haley now. Um, just following on from some of the things that Maha raised around uh, domestic violence, and we we may well come back to that with you, Maha. Um, Haley, can you share with us um, what you think is going on at the moment in terms of women's economic security and how this plays a role in women's safety and ability to leave violence? And then I'll ask you to also pick uh, something that resonated for you from, from Emma's speech. Yeah, wow. Well, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm coming to you from Gadigal country and paying my respects to elders in the past, in the future um, and present and, uh, and also extend that respect to Nareen and, and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. Um, it's a great privilege um, to be here on country and to be talking about this really critical issue that um, faces all women um, but disproportionately impacts um, upon our First Nations women. Um, and you know, any of us who have worked in regional, rural and remote communities know that there can be additional um, layers there as well. And, and Noreen talked about all the interse uh, other intersections like uh, women with disability. Um, so yeah, like I think just want to acknowledge that. And um, and actually before I answer your question, Carolyn, if I could just also just touch upon some of the things that um, Maha and Noreen have actually mentioned. Um, and that is that um, I think that, you know, this is critical. It's about reflection of, you know, white feminism, those in those positions of power. Um, you know, for me, I think um, a huge part of this is about having um, women of all diverse backgrounds and experiences at the decision making table, because at the end of the day, this is about power. And we do need all of us need to reflect upon our privilege um, whenever we're in a, a position of power ourselves, but we can't rely upon that. You know, at the end of the day, um, there is going to be blindness, there is going to be uh, discrimination and prejudice. Um, and, you know, people who are not living it are not able to make the decisions. They don't know. They don't know from lived experience. Um, and, and so we have to make sure, I think, at the very uh, first and foremost, before I talk about my knowledge, um, to just acknowledge that we need to have people who are impacted by the laws and the policies and the practices um, that we're putting in place at the decision making table at, at, at all um, junctures. And I think part of, part of reflecting upon one's privilege is about actually in action, um, making, you know, nurturing, supporting, mentoring, and, and providing space for those who need to be at the decision making table to do so. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, also, the really important point that Nareem was making about the, the fact that we are looking at sort of big systems and structures and prevention, um, but we can't just rely upon that. If we just focus on those big picture kind of structures um, and reforms, um, we risk leaving people behind um, and those that we most need to be paying attention to. So I think, um, I guess what I would say to that is we, we need to walk and chew gum. We need to make sure that there are more women and diverse women at the decision making table when talking about boards, of course, um, in government, uh, you know, but also in community. Um, and we also need to make sure that we're not um, letting, leaving behind the generations um, that are impacted now. You know, no amount of, of addressing the pay gap is going to address uh, the issues that are being faced by older women. Um, right now, uh, we need to focus on things like social housing. Um, we need to focus on things uh, like superannuation, supplementary uh, payments and those sorts of things. They're the things that need to happen right now amongst many others. Um, and we can't leave people behind. We have to do uh, look at the whole broad spectrum of things. So um, sorry to not directly answer your question. I will now directly answer your question. That is about um, you know, what resonated with me with um, Emma's speech is, is about that um, 
the economic disempowerment and, and discrimination and um, in, inequity. Uh, and for me, every time we hear this, I, I think about all of the women that I on the front line have supported and, and that the, my um, staff are supporting day in, day out, who are impacted by uh, sexual and domestic and family violence. Um, and in, in so many cases, it's just there's a, that inextricable link between women's economic security um, and violence against women and, and children as well. And I think um, we can't ignore that. There is so much that we can be doing. I do think that, um, you know, look, for example, one of the projects we're working on uh, is where NRMA is supporting uh, Rape and Domestic Violence Services Australia to distribute cash grants um, to women who are in unsafe situations to help them. And they're untied, they don't have to like mark down exactly what they're spending it on because women are the experts of their own situation. Now that's helping uh, it's making a huge difference for those individual circumstances to break away, but it's not fixing. It's like a Band-Aid, you know, it's not fixing um, that, that ongoing economic um, situation. Well, look, we know that um, economic, like financial abuse and economic insecurity is one of the key barriers to women and their children actually achieving safety, escaping from violent and abusive situations. Um, and what they also tell us is that it is also one of the biggest long lasting impacts when you do leave um, because of that insecurity. Um, so I think there are so many things that we need to look at now. There are urgent um, uh, policies and practices that we can do to address that financial insecurity now. But I think we also need to be looking at some of those bigger system and structural changes. Um, and that is around um, you know, uh, social security and you know, the partner rule. That is about taxation law. That is about superannuation, the wage, the wage gap social housing and investment in social infrastructure, including, including social housing. It's about all of those free childcare. Um, you know, the amount of difference that that would make to so many women, um, you know, I just can't, I can't overstate it. So I guess that's the main, the main kind of aspects of what resonated uh, with me. I think that there is cause to be hopeful. I think um, that we are at this you know, we talked about the momentum, of, momentum for change. That's what this is all about. There is momentum right now. And I don't, don't think we've ever seen so much acknowledgement um, of, for example, the inextricable link, where, you know, between economic insecurity and violence against women. Uh, I know the progressive government's been talking about this for a really long time, um, but we're now seeing, you know, the coalition, the prime minister, the minister for women, the women's minister, the women's economic security minister, all standing up and talking at a, about this openly and acknowledging it. Um, and that's that's exciting and that's progress and that's a tribute to everybody who's been standing up and speaking out about this for so long. Um, so I, I think that there is progress. I know that with the, at the you know, the Women's Safety Summit and the next uh, Success and National Plan uh, and Violence Against Women and Their Children, um, I know that there is now an explicit acknowledgement that we need to have that integrated with all of the other plans and strategies, the closing the gap, um, June Oscar's uh, report, uh, the um, economic, women's economic security, the mental health strategy, the disability strategy, the ageing strategy. Um, and so that's exciting to me because it's about leveraging all those other aspects of our social policy. You know, imagine we actually diverted um, a lot of our mental health spending to, um, to actual trauma um, recovery, trauma support and management and recovery services, um, which is actually what we need it for. And we know that violence against women um, is the single biggest preventable driver of death, disability and illness. And a huge part of that is mental illness. And yet um, we, don't have, we don't have access to that. You know, we've got this women's safety budget that's this tiny little pocket here, insignificant. We talked about, Emma talked about the women's econ economic security um, statement. Again, tiny pocket, but how do we leverage all those other uh, resources across the economy? So I think that there is, is cause to be, uh, to be hopeful. Um, one little anecdote I'll give, um, and I, if you just, um, it's just around, you know, young women who are getting their periods, right? Um, now you've got them saying, you know, what is this? What do I have to do? Like, I have to do this every month. Why do I have to do this, right? And, um, and I think that that's the kind of thing where you're like, you know, we just accepted it. it was just all part of what we, you know, but now it's like the expectations are changing. And I think that that's something to be hopeful about. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled, Haley, that you um, you see those little chinks of hope and that you agree with me that the momen momentum is there. And Emma, I just want to come to you on that subject of momentum, because on Monday I attended a Zoom meeting which was organised through the Voices of or Voices for Movement. 
And um, we had a speaker from Voices for Indi, Dennis Ginnivan, who was telling us how the campaign for Helen Haynes was run. And it's an absolutely extraordinary story. And for those of you that get the chance to watch the film The Big Deal, uh, which I think you can um, purchase online, which is a film about how to strengthen uh, democracy and make it more robust at a grassroots level. Uh, the Voices for Indi story is mentioned in there. So I just wanted to ask you whether you are encouraged by that initiative towards participatory democracy at a grassroots level and supporting the emergence of more independent candidates. I just read an article by Michael West this morning, which says that there are currently more than 30 such groups across Australia, many of them in safe seats. So are they going to shake things up at the next election? It's a really interesting point, Carolyn. Um, I think that for this group, the, the interesting thing about the Voices of movement and the Climate 200 movement, which Simon Holmes of Court is, is putting behind a lot of these independent candidates. So the first thing to note is they're standing in Liberal seats, Liberal held seats. They A lot of them consider themselves centre-right, so small L Liberal, uh, socially progressive, economically conservative. And they're challenging often some of the more um, progressive members of the Liberal Party in blue ribbon seats. The three issues that they've identified as core to their campaign are action on climate change, integrity in government, so a federal integrity commission, and gender equality, the rights of women. These are three issues that shouldn't be left right issues, right? They should, they, they should not be, they, they shouldn't be ideologically um, swayed at this point in the 21st century. We know we have to act on climate change. Integrity in politics should be non-controversial, as should the equality of 51% of the population. So the really interesting thing to me is that there are a lot of um, very civically minded independent candidates who are saying that our current government or the party of government has made these issues somehow into a left-right thing, that, that they're seen as a progressive rather than a conservative issue, and they shouldn't be. That's really interesting to me, you know, that, that we're trying to depoliticise three issues, but surely we can all get together on those, right? Um, in terms of participatory democracy, I think what it does show is a, a, a frustration in the community that particularly on those issues, that they have been so highly politicised and they shouldn't be, and we want to, to make progress on them now. Um, and so I think that's where that, that grassroots movement is coming from. And I think it was even more remarkable with the women's marches earlier this year. And I attended the one in Canberra. I was up there for work the next day, so I decided to go up a day early. Um, what was remarkable about that march was it genuinely represented the Australian population, unlike the people in the building behind us, right? So there were people from all backgrounds. There were First Nations women and men. There were plenty of men. There were young people. There were older first generation feminists who were saying, you know, I haven't seen anything like this since 1983. Um, it was genuinely representative of the Australian population. And I think that that is translating to people getting more involved in, in grassroots politics because they are incredibly frustrated at the lack of progress on some really big things that we thought we were doing well 25 years ago, you know? Um, and I think that that covers people, people of all voting persuasions, the, maybe not the extreme left and the extreme right, but the 80% of us that sit somewhere in the middle. Um, and I think I, I personally, believe as Noreen does that we need a change of government, um, <laughs> desperately a change of government. I'm not uh, reassured that the independence holding a balance of power in a, in a government, in the current government would, would make a great deal of difference. For example, um, the, if, if, the, if a independence held the balance of power in the house, yes, they could pass an, a bill calling on the government uh, making it, you know, parliamentary policy to establish a federal integrity commission, but they couldn't make the government actually fund it. So you actually need a party in government that has said, yes, we will fund and set it up. Yes, we will embrace the Uluru Statement from the heart. Yes, we will act on climate change. That doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't very, very important, because I think what it is, is a recognition that that one side of politics certainly has been dragged so far beyond where the majority of people who support that party, where Simon Holmes Accord has said, sensible centrist right-wing voters have lost their place to go. And so it's an effort, I think, to bring Australian politics 
back to where the Australian people are. And that's a very good thing. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, just a reminder that if you've Can got I a question. Say, though, I think we need to um, really think about the different independents, particularly if they're running in the seats we live in. And I think probably in, in the instance I'm about to be critical of, she did reflect her constituents, but I'm sick and tired of hearing how Zali Stegall is a friend of women. She voted with the government on the industrial relations laws, which has a profound effect, particularly on women um, who aren't wealthy. So I just think I, I'm a bit sick and tired of hearing about how all women are good for women. And I think that is the perfect example. It is. Can I just back that up? I mean, <laughs> Noreen and I are both, you know, lefties. So we, we, we but it's about understanding what affects. And it goes back to that point about C-suite feminism and corporate feminism, right? Yeah. Sally Stegall yeah. is a corporate feminist, right? Absolutely. But she's not going to make the changes. Everything I talked about this morning about the insecure work that women face, the low paid feminised industries, there's no intention to do much about that. In the in, amongst these groups, so we need to go. Yes, it's you know it's important that we pass respect at work, but it's also critically important that we look at the material causes of disadvantage that women, people of colour, First Nations people, people with disabilities, all marginalised groups suffer the most from. And just like I you know pointed out recently, it's all it's great that the UK has a a, a female immigration minister from an Indian background, but she's actually one of the harshest. Um, in immigration in their history, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Scared, absolutely. Patel scares the bejesus out. Yeah, she scares the bejesus matters, out of me too. Not so. what, it matters. It does matter that our parliament is representative of our diversity, but it matters much more what politicians do than who they are. Look, and I think it's really important that you raise the issue that just because someone's called an independent doesn't mean they can't be an independent and a conservative at the same time. So thank exactly. you for that reminder from both of you. Can I just um, also just remind everybody watching that if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom right of your screen, and we will try and come to it. I'm going to leave some time at the end of this discussion um, for those questions. And also, I just want to acknowledge a comment from one of the participants, Roy Stark, who's written, I'm concerned that transgender women are rarely discussed in these forums. Can they be included in the conversation, please? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for raising that issue. Um, can I come back to you, actually? Can I Nikki? comment there yeah, yeah. from the point of view of our community? Absolutely, Roy, and I'm really glad you raised it. But in our community, there's a lot of work going on by transgender people around how our community looked um, prior to colonisation and how it approached and what the effect of colonialism has been on how we approach gender in our communities. And what I would suggest you do is follow Professor Sandy O'Sullivan on Twitter who at Macquarie University who is at the forefront of these discussions in our community and what they're doing around gender in an academic and community sense. Um, but we are absolutely committed to including transgender people in our community discussions and where um, and honouring the position of gender diverse people in our communities. And, and I would Thank just you. add, if I could very briefly, both transgender women and transgender men and non-binary people are affected by the issues that, that we've been talking about that affect women across the life course. Um, depending on what, what point people transition or at how they identify, they can be affected more or less by any one of those things. But they are amongst the most marginalised group of people in our country, um, and we do not adequately include um, their concerns in, in, in political representation at all as yet. And thank you for that. And I think that that's also a pointer to us at the Older Women's Network, and we will make sure that their voices are represented in the next forum that we have. Um, Maha, can we come back to you? Um, I'd like to ask you about a program that you initiated where you got men involved to stop violence against women. And I was just wondering whether you could tell us a little bit about that and what you learned from that process. 
Sure. <clears throat> I think um, we've got many programs that have included men, and one of them is the uh, ambassador program for our um, Linking Hearts program. And bring men in from different walks of life and different ethnic groups um, for them to understand what really is domestic violence. I think that's the first point is knowing that so many men without realizing were um, those unintended, um, you know, people sitting and listening and watching violence happening right in front of them without really doing anything about that. So we talked about, you know, um, you know, you, you know, um, all the, all, some of those concerns that women, and they were listening to women's lived experience. I think, yeah, so it's not about that, that program it has been going on now for about four years and the, and the, um, uh, the ambassadors have grown really, really far and wide from, from one of the, from our police local commander to, um, you know, heads of industry, um, heads of sport, crunch fitness, all of the above. But that it doesn't stop there um, because each one of them has their own little circle of influence, or sometimes it's a big circle of influence, and having the conversation, having the uncomfortable um, conversation about what does <clears throat> domestic violence look like. Look like. And, and that, we've seen that that's been, you know, the feedback we're getting now is that, um, you know, there's so many people wanting to put their hand up to support and to make a difference. What does that, what does it look like? They wanna be, you know, um, active. So there's a lot of programs, there's mentoring programs going on, there's industry partnership going on between, you know, different um, cohorts to really have that sort of a, um, you know, awareness, right? And then on the part of supporting other women and families who are, who are going through, um, you know, whether it's, um, uh, physical violence or financial abuse <clears throat> or coercive control in a way that is, you know, the emotional abuse stuff. These were the things that highlighted and they said they didn't even know that. How do you, how do you tell the difference? How do you, how do you tell if someone's been emotionally abused? Um, so different cultures have different ways of recognizing that. So we went through all of that. But right now we have a program, uh, we have an, a national project called Faith and cultural um, engagement. And what, we want, what we're doing with this um, program is actually going down, digging deeper, listening and identifying what the real issues of concern to men are. How do they see women? How do they, what does gender look like to them from a gender lens, you know? What are their intersectionalities that they look at? Because we wanted to, we, want, we are listening to what they're saying and we're finding no, no difference than what already the, um, the research is saying to us about the difference between the older men and the young men and the young men's influence by, you know, all the physics and the physical, um, you know, the, the sports violence and that's, you know, <clears throat> that sort of a, a cultural um, Australian way of life, you know, hey, mate, you've got to be strong and, and you, don't, you don't show a tear, right? You don't shed a tear as a young man. But... And, that, and what, we're, what we're finding now, we're going back to bringing faith as a tool for empowerment for the men in the community to say, it's okay to be kind. It's okay to show emotions hmm? as a man, because in the social construct of uh, with the Western um, ideological world is men don't show um, emotions, right? You gotta be strong, you gotta be tough. So as, as, as very much as what was happening and we talked about for, with our Indigenous brothers and sisters, it's the same thing, you know, that you have to fit into that sort of a, um, you know, box or, or package of what a masculine man looks like. It's all about the body. And what we're saying, we're taking it back to the roots of the faith, the spiritual of the heart, the discipline. And that's been so, so spiritually elevating that I'd love to talk about it at a, in such a very, and bringing young men and old men to talk about what it feels like for them. Because that's when, you know, you say the light bulb moment, it was for a lot of men were saying, I had no idea. I thought our culture, was you have to be like you know you can't talk about those women issues and all of yeah. that so I think bringing back the heart 
to the to the men's mind and interacting and listening with your heart and allowing change to evolve and this is just in that and we're developing a hopefully a resource pack for um for stakeholders um in the space of domestic violence so that we can start having that change it's not about anger management it's not about sending them to specific counseling without having a holistic approach to the male dominated physical um, affiliation, as you, you say, as we, it is known. So um, there's, there's been so much, um, you know, um, improvements and so much has been elevated where, um, you know, people are seeing faith can be good for me because I can ident identify my weaknesses and I can be vulnerable, but at the same time, I can learn what the next steps are. And I don't feel that I'm being ashamed. The well, that's stigma. it, isn't it? It's very yeah. much about shifting taboos around shame and about yeah. stereotypes of masculinity that no longer apply in the world in which they find themselves. So thank yeah. you very much for that. I just want to ask you just, if you could just comment briefly on the impact of the March for Justice on the cohort that you represent, because it seems to me, you know, we've touched on the sort of symbolic uh, power of the march and that sense of momentum that many of us have experienced since the march and that kind of, you know, hashtag enough is enough. Does something like the March of Justice speak to your cohort or is it profoundly irrelevant? Look, I, I can't just wipe it all out and say it doesn't. It actually touches the surface. And it, and, 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 and it gives power to, um, to all of us as, as what I think Haley was alluding to, that it has to be an inclusive conversation. We're having that conversation. And I think that was the beginning. It started to have that internal conversation in the community amongst women. And, and, I, and I remember early this year, Haley, you were on the forum that we had that bit of that conversation around that, started to unpack what, what does it look like? What does justice look like? And, and, and it doesn't take away from the reality of the pain, the trauma. But I think when we're talking about assets-based um, approaches and framework, that has to come in and be very much owned and, and, and by the community so that it is sort of a top, you know, top down and, 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 and bottom up, so that there is a middle ground that we're all actually can, can have that conversation and can uh, whether it's through march with uh, marches for justice or, or equality mm. um i think you know the actual march really gave power for all of us to start having that conversation and really start speaking up and calling it out in a way that it is engaging that it is not shaming it is not blaming but it is about making a difference and changing hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maha. Nareen, can we come back to you? you? So much of the conversation and so much of the theme of Emma's speech was around economic issues and reframing how we value care as opposed to digging things out of the ground. And I was just wondering whether you could give us your take on um, the Indu card, the impact of the Indu card and the impact on the notion of self-determination and agency that is so critical to equality for Indigenous people? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm opposed to the Indu card. Jambana is opposed to the Indu card. We've done a lot of policy work, not so much recently, but in years go, gone by. Um, we've done a lot of work um, in opposition to the intervention more generally, to the Northern Territory intervention more generally. And um, the Indu card is a natural follow-on um, from the intervention. We're strongly opposed to it. I'm strongly opposed to it. It is the most, um, it, what's the word? It's just mean. It is just incredibly mean. I think um, it, it's starting to permeate on Australians about the proposal to bring it in for pensioners, yeah. um, which I think really needs to be publicised by groups like yours. Um, I just find it abhorrent that people who've worked all their lives would have to, but I find it abhorrent that anyone 
that this approach to um, social support is taken to anyone. Um, the approach to it being implemented in, in, in Indigenous communities in the first instance is racist, just as the intervention is racist and the notion that the Race Discrimination Act is still suspended to allow the intervention to happen is extraordinary to me and um, should be something that all Australians who have a commitment to human rights should be up in arms about. But like most Indigenous issues, we don't find that. Um, so I um, couldn't say in stronger terms that we should be campaigning on rejecting the injury card. I, I notice that the Minaroo Foundation, which is Andrew Forrest's foundation, seems to be putting itself into the mainstream and gets invited to things to talk and have an opinion. I just think that Australians should reject Andrew Forrest's views on Indigenous communities, given his history, his family's history and his record of commercial operations and how Indigenous communities are treated mm. in that context. Um, it's really about what he can get out of communities' land. Um, so I absolutely reject the Indu card. Thank you. Thank you for that very pithy kind of <laughs> summary of why we... Yeah, well, if you're going to ask me, you're going to get yeah. a response. That's why you're here. That <laughs> is why you're here. Um, Hayley, can I come to you uh, now? We're, we're running perilously short of time, as of course we were always going to. But anyway, these conversations will continue, hopefully. Um, you were very involved in the recent National Safety Summit for Women, and we know that violence against women is a national emergency. And at a community level, there seems to be a real awareness and a real desire for us to um, address the gravity of the situation. So given that, given the fact that there is a kind of groundswell of awareness, why do you think it is not being responded to adequately still by decision makers across all levels of society? Thanks, Caroline. Look, I think, um, and I, you know, I wanted to kind of wrap up quickly because I was banging on last time, but um, what I was going to say is that there is momentum, there's huge signs of positivity, but it's not actually happening in action quick enough, and we need to actually work really hard to make sure it, ha it happens. Why is it not happening quickly? Um, again, it's about power. You know, who's in power? What are, you, what are the interests of those in power at the moment? Because at the end of the day, you've got to give up some of that power if you're going to more equally distribute it. Um, so I think that what we need to do is make sure that um, their power is um, at stake if, <laughs> if they don't act. So part of that is we have an incredibly strong evidence base. Noreen's spoken about a lot of it um, already. Emma's uh, address um, really gave us so much of the evidence base, but it's not about getting more evidence base. It's about making that heard. Um, and I think, um, you know, really, that's about elevating those issues and being as loud as possible um, in every single aspect, in every single corner of the community. Um, and so I think, I actually think it's about making sure that we don't stand down, we don't go away. We've seen that with the Credible Women's Movement. Um, I'm getting, you know, you asked uh, Maha about the March for Justice and what impact that's made. Um, there is so much um, impact that that's had. I've got so many young women constantly calling up and, and telling me about their ideas and what they're gonna be doing. And our organization, Rape and Domestic Violence Services Australia is just trying to uplift them and try to get them out into the forefront and in front of those decision makers and into the media. Um, but also um, older women, women who have been through this, have been working their guts out for decades, um, laying the groundwork for this, contacting us and saying, you know what, there's hope. I'm enlivened by this. I'm re-energised. I'm reinvigorated. So we need to actually put that to good use and we need to be public about it and we need to go um, to every single decision maker and make as, as, as big a fuss as possible because at the end of the day, the evidence base is there. This is now about making, uh, getting, getting um, this over the line and actually creating those actions. 
And I think one of the things that that occurs to me as a result of you saying that, Haley, is that in a lot of the discussions now, I am seeing a kind of generational separation where the younger women who are using social, social media very, very effectively to get these messages across sometimes forget that there are older women there standing on the sidelines who would make fantastic mentors and that, you know, we are a, we are an army that that needs to kind of be united on this front. And this should not be an age related related issue. So, um, so thank you for, for mentioning um, the momentum again behind the March for Justice. Now, when I introduced Emma, uh, it seems like days ago, but when I introduced Emma uh, before she, um, she gave her keynote this morning, I laid my cards on the table and said that I wish that she uh, was in Parliament. Um, so I'm going to finish by asking you all whether you can speak speak briefly to the idea of if you could be prime minister for a week what changes would you bring in in that in that one week so I'm going to go to you Emma oh my god <laughs> uh, it would, I'd, I'd, I'd do the total goff it'd be maybe me and Noreen would sit down around the table and reframe the country um, for, I'd introduce free childcare. I would remove all for-profit providers from aged and disability care and fully fund uh, nurse ratios and RNs in aged care. I would invest significantly in workforce development for the services industry. I would completely overhaul our immigration program and return to permanent migration and family reunion rather than temporary guest workers. I would completely overhaul the tax and transfer system and um, put a lot more, get a lot more of our uh, government revenue from wealth rather than from income. Um, uh, I would pay superannuation on pay on all forms of leave, including parental leave, and I would legislate a move over time to a standard four day full time working week. That would be my first week and then I'd go from there. OK, so you're elected unopposed. <laughs> right. Moving moving along. Um, let's see. Noreen, if you were prime minister for a week, what would you do? Everything that Emma said, um, plus I would have labourist, um, feminist economists like Emma um, formulating policy. Um, I would introduce the Uluru Statement immediately. I would increase um, significantly funding to Aboriginal communities around um, in a self-determinationist way around land use, sea use and um, housing. I would recognise um, CD, the CDP program um, as a program that should include caring for community and country. I would make CDP run by communities. I would ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are paid as work for community for caring responsibilities and community responsibilities, and um, I would um, uh, did I say introduce the Uluru Statement in four yeah. years? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Consider it done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Maha. What about you? If you were prime minister for a week. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I fully would agree with all of what's been said, but uh, personally, I would want to listen to the people first before making any decisions. Um, and I want to, I would love to create a space where vulnerability is something that is seen as a strength, not a weakness. And before making any decisions about policies, um, look at the effect it has on the health and well being of the overall country and its arching principle as a equitable, you know, as a place for uh, looking at uh, equity, not in the dollar sign, but in the most, um, you know, productive way so that economy, it does not equal dollars, it e equals healthy um, community, healthy society, because if, if we have a healthy society that is diverse, that it actually, um, you know, it takes its pride on its diversity, then the economy will really lift up in so many ways and take Australia to another level. Um, 
across the globe. Absolutely, we should be we should be working towards gross national happiness rather than GNP G GDP. Sorry. Uh, finally, we've got just a minute left, Haley. Everybody's already um, been through their checklists. Have you got anything left to add? I would just make sure that these women were at the tables <laughs> telling you what to do. Um, I think that that's probably the most thing. The other thing that I would just personally do right away is a massive investment in social and affordable housing. Um, trauma, universal access to trauma specialist um, support healthcare. Um, I would abolish the equal sh shared parental responsibility uh, presumption in family law and make sure that um, this economic insecurity that is built into our lives for women um, is, is dealt with in the Family Law Act around past contributions, but also future needs, um, equal parental leave um, entitlements, the list goes on. But I think the most important thing that I would do is have um, those key, key people at the table to make decisions for their own communities. Okay, you're all elected for a week. <laughs> That's a fantastic wish list um, for us to progress our conversations within the Older Women's Network. Thank you all for your time and sharing your wisdom today as we work towards a more compassionate, more inclusive society. Thank you also to everybody watching today. I feel sure that everyone here has a contribution to make. Please share this video with anyone that you think might be interested and let's continue these conversations in our communities. As I mentioned before, I'll be back tomorrow morning at 10 with Linda Burney and Ashton Applewhite um, to talk about how we combat ageism, which is an integral part of the um, injustice justices that we need to redress. Um, see you all tomorrow and thank you so much everyone who was on the panel today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.